Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. In 1 Kings chapter 17, wicked King Ahab has just ascended the throne over Israel. The Bible describes Ahab by saying that he did more evil and did more to provoke God to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. That's an epic record to hold. And even on top of that, he marries a pagan priestess named Jezebel and begins to worship her false god named Baal. And God sends the prophet Elijah to confront Ahab and his wicked ways. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 Now it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh and you have followed the Baals. So now then send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So on top of Mount Carmel, Elijah confronts all of Israel for their disobedience to God, and he proposes a test. He will build an altar to Yahweh, and the false prophets will build an altar to Baal. Whichever God answers by fire, that's the one true God, and the people will then commit to worshiping that one true God. And they all agree, it's a great idea. Elijah politely lets the prophets of Baal go first. So they build their altar and they place their sacrifice on it and nothing happens. So they dance and they chant and they cut themselves and nothing happens. Elijah then openly mocks them. Why don't you cry louder? He can't hear you. He's getting old. Maybe he's deaf. Maybe he's asleep. Or my favorite, I think he's probably in the bathroom. Maybe he took a trip. He's out of town. But he can't hear you right now, so they do cry louder. They cut themselves even more. The end of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 29. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Well, now it's Elijah's turn. He builds the altar. He places the bull on it. He then digs a trench around the altar and instructs them to dump a crazy amount of water over the top of the altar and even fills the trench. And then Elijah prays, 1 Kings 18, verse 36. Now it happened at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Oh, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your slave, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Yahweh, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it and fell on their faces and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. It's an incredible and decisive victory for God, for Elijah, for all of Israel. And after this great prophet directly faces 850 false prophets and winning such, in such an epic fashion, this is what happens next. 1 Kings 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And he was afraid 
and rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his young man there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Yahweh, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, he will eventually flee all the way to Mount Horeb, which is known as the mountain of God, and God will meet him there. Pay close attention to Elijah's words, 1 Kings 19, verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, pulled down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left And they seek my life to take it away. Elijah has just dominated in battle over the prophets of Baal. 850 to 1, and he wins. And then Jezebel issues a one-sentence threat, and he runs for the hills. And he feels utterly alone. I'm the only one left. Everyone else in the nation has forsaken the Lord. Everybody else is wicked. I'm the only faithful one left. That's how he felt. It wasn't true, but it felt like it was. In fact, a few verses later, God will tell him that I have over 7,000 faithful Israelites who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah, you are not alone. You never were. This issue, feeling alone, even when you're not, is the core message of Psalm 12. So let's go there, let's read the psalm, and then we'll spend some time working through it. Psalm 12, verse 1. Save, O Yahweh, for the holy man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak worthlessness to one another. With a flattering lip and with a double heart they speak. May Yahweh cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Yahweh. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of Yahweh are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. You, O Yahweh, will keep them. You will guard him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. King David is pouring out his heart to God. And notice there's no personal language from David. He never says, I, me, or mine. David's prayer is centered on others. It's centered on the nation. It's not some specific issue that he's caught up in. So much like Psalm 11 that we saw last week, we we cannot pinpoint any specific historical event that's being referred to. So the psalm feels a bit more universal and timeless in its scope, and rightly so because we deal with the exact same issues to this day. I mean, we resonate with David's cry here. We look around at a once God-fearing society that was built on God's own law that is seemingly crumbling around us. That's what David feels right now. We understand that. He feels utterly alone in his faithfulness to God. So what do you do as a faithful Christian in a culture that seems to be spiraling away from the Lord? How do you handle the sense of isolation when it, comes, when it seems like you're the only one who's holding the line? You're the only one that you know of the people around you in your life that seems to be loving God. What is our response to a world in rebellion to God knowing that we are absolutely powerless to change it? This is where Psalm 12 really helps us. 
So what do you do in that environment? Number one, we pray for help. That's what we do. We pray for help. Verse one, save, O Yahweh. That's a striking statement coming right out of the gate. Now, when he says save, he's not referring to eternal salvation. He's referring to rescue. For whatever issue it is that he's talking about, he asks for rescue. So what is it that he needs God to step into and save him from? Well, two parallel statements are given. The holy man ceases to be and the faithful disappear. Well, those are synonymous with one another. Those who love the Lord, those who can be trusted to keep their word, and the context of the psalm as a whole makes the case for that, that it's not just they're faithful to God, but they're faithful to the words that they say. The word used for faithful is related to the word for truth. So all those in the land that I can trust, all those in the land who are faithful to the word, who entrust themselves to the Lord, they're all gone. They have vanished without a trace. It feels like that at times, doesn't it? You walk into the workplace and you realize that you don't really trust anything that anybody says. You turn on the news, same thing. You open social media and you know that it's all for show. And when a large enough group does that, it leaves us with a culture that is oppressive and dangerous. It all seems like a fitting conclusion to Psalm 10 and 11. Again, these are, these are in the order they're in for a reason. In Psalm 10, we were introduced to the words of the wicked. In fact, we'll, we'll talk about those words here in just a little bit. Psalm 11 that we spent time last Sunday looking at tells us that the wicked were destroying the foundations of their society, the moral fabric of their way of life. They're bending their bow. They're ready to shoot their arrows against God's people. It seems like they're winning. Well, now in Psalm 12, we're told that the arrows of the wicked that they were preparing to shoot in Psalm 11, apparently they hit their mark. Because when David looks around at culture, he says, there's no godly people to be found. They've all been taken out. And what are we left with? Verse two, the the godless, the wicked, they speak worthlessness to one another. With a flattering lip and with a double heart, they speak. Well, when the godly and the faithful are gone, all you have left is emptiness and worthlessness, vanity. It it simply means empty. Pay attention to modern entertainment today. It is utterly empty. It is without substance. In in fact, this word, they, they speak worthlessness to one another. That word is used in the Bible to refer to false gods because they're empty. They lack substance. They're not there. So David says all the conversations in the land are empty and they are dishonest. They have no good purpose. And they do all of this, David says, with a flattering lip. So that takes it a step further because it adds an evil motive. The word for flatter means smooth. When they speak, they're buttering you up. They're smoothing things out in the name of getting something for themselves. They tell you what you want to hear so that they will personally benefit. And they speak, he says, with a double heart. Well, now we're at the root of the problem. This is what's really going on. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34, that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your words really aren't about your words. The righteous, Jesus said, speak out of a reservoir of righteousness in their heart. The wicked speak out of a reservoir of wickedness in their heart. So the issue is not their words. The issue is their heart that fuels those words. From a wicked heart, their words mislead 
and manipulate. From a wicked heart, their words flatter and are fake. So, verse 3, David asks God to act specifically. Cut off their lips and cut out their tongue. This is what we love about the Psalms. They're quite blunt. Now, it's not a literal request. Don't go out and sharpen your knife this afternoon. And here's how we know that. Cutting off lips and cutting out tongues do not solve the problem of a wicked heart. This is a simple, poetic way of asking God to do what the psalmists continually ask God to do. Cut them off. Destroy them. Bring justice to this issue. Because their tongues speak great things. Meaning boastful arrogant things. This has been a a problem of humanity since the very beginning. All the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, mankind has been boastfully declaring how awesome we are. And verse 4 is one of those great boasts. Psalm 12, verse 4, who have said with our tongue, we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who's Lord over us? Our tongue, we will prevail. Prevail is related to the word for powerful. It's used later in Psalm 45 to refer to a strong and mighty warrior. My tongue cannot be defeated. There's nothing that can stand in the way. The smooth talk, the blowhard boasting, it's going to win the day. Notice they said our lips are our own. We can say whatever we want. I don't answer to you. You can't tell me what I can and cannot say. I can say whatever I want and get away with it. No one can stop us. Back to Psalm 10, as we're introduced originally to the words of the wicked. Psalm 10, verse 3. For the wicked boasts of his soul's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns Yahweh. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says in his heart, I will not be shaken from generation to generation. I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. All that's confirmed again in Psalm 12. What is it that the wicked say? Whatever we want. And we're going to win. God's not paying attention. You can't defeat me. I win. Notice how they ended Psalm 12, verse 4. Who is Lord over us? I mean, that's the issue of issues right there, isn't it? We answer to no one. We don't answer to God. We don't answer to you. We're successful, we're powerful, we're in charge. There is this unwillingness on the part of the wicked to submit to any form of authority. And when such boastful arrogance is joined with deception, when it's joined with a willingness to mislead for the sake of personal gain, when, friends, when that happens, there is no limit to the destruction that they can cause. David has done all that he can do. He feels alone. He's outnumbered. He's overwhelmed. And I feel that way at times, so do you. You work hard, but you cannot overcome the toxic environment at work. Your work ethic doesn't change that. You love your spouse, but you can't prevent the betrayal. You can discipline your kids, but you can't change their heart. You can be a good citizen, but you don't control who's in office and the decisions they make. All David knows to do, all that we could possibly do, is cry out to God for help. And he helps. Number two, God promises to help. So now we come to verse five. 
Verse 5 is the focal point of the entire psalm. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Yahweh. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. Now, this is incredibly rare in the Psalms that God would speak directly. This is only the second time so far in the first 12 Psalms that God does speak directly. The other one is Psalm 2. So as, as David is writing this, instead of telling us about his confidence that God's gonna answer his prayer, he is so confident in that conclusion that he writes God's words for him. Now I will arise. Now, that, that's a noticeable theme in the Psalms. We've seen it already multiple times. Chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 19. Chapter 10, verse 12. Where the psalmist asks God to arise. Now even God himself uses it. It's a call to war. It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus where God's people cry out for God to arise and lead them in battle. As they're going out to fight an enemy, God arise so that we can win. And God says, now I arise. He's rising up in active defense of his people in an active attack against the enemy. Now I will arise. A, a divine turning point for sure. God goes from being patient to delivering. What took him so long? I mean, God, couldn't God have stepped in earlier and simply stopped it all from going the way that it did? Well, of course he could have. But he often doesn't, does he? I'm reminded of Exodus 3, when God calls Moses at the burning bush for Moses to go and deliver the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. This is the exchange, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sufferings. So I've come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now come, I'll send you to Pharaoh, and so you shall bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt." I mean, certainly encouraging words. God sees. He, he knows. He hears the cries. He sees the oppression. When God says that to Moses in Exodus 3, Israel had been in slavery for 430 years. And now he's going to see and hear? What about the previous four centuries? Did you not see? Did you not hear? Did you not care? I mean, there were generations who had trusted in God, who were born, lived, and died without ever seeing the deliverance that God had promised to them. I know how easy it is to be impatient with what's happening in the world, to watch the news and be frustrated and to scroll through whatever app you scroll through and hear what people say and see what people do, to look in the mirror and be frustrated with what you say and with what you do. I know those frustrations, wondering why it is that God hasn't done something about that yet. Frustrated that the boss continues to make work miserable. Frustrated that the spouse keeps causing pain. Frustrated that a child keeps making foolish decisions. And you've prayed, you've trusted, you've hoped, but nothing has changed yet. Keep the faith. God does what he wants when he wants. His timeline is not yours or mine. His timing is focused on eternity. He knows better than we do. He promises to help. We trust that he will. 
Verse 6, the words of Yahweh are pure words. As silver is tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. So in contrast now to the boastful, empty, deceptive words of the wicked, God's words are true and trustworthy. They're pure words. They're without flaw. They are perfect. They're like silver that's been in the smelting furnace, heated up with all of the impurities removed seven times, the number of perfection in the Bible. So God's words aren't just pure. They are the purest of pure. Not meaning that God's words used to have hints of imperfection and they had to be kind of cleaned up a little bit, and now they're to be trusted. God's words are already like the finished product of perfect purification. There is no error. There is no flaw. When God speaks, it is clear, it is reliable, it is true. In a world such as David describes, in a world such that we live, it's a comfort to know. God's words are trustworthy. Even when it seems like everyone around is lying, there is one who doesn't who always tells the truth. So David now turns and addresses God directly again with more words of confidence. Because God's words are pure, God's promises become expectations. We're not presuming on God when we believe his promises are true because his words are pure. He meant it. He's not lying. Verse seven, you, O Yahweh, will keep them, your words, You will guard him from this generation forever. You'll guard him from the wickedness that surrounds him. You'll keep them. You'll guard them. Notice that he did not say, God, you will remove them from the situation. He did not promise that, never has. What he does promise is in the midst of the challenge, in the midst of the wicked society, God promises to preserve and to keep his faithful. He keeps them. Listen to Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to stumble He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from now until forever. It's almost like Psalm 121 has a theme and has a message for you to know. He will keep you. He keeps his faithful faithful in the midst of whatever it is that they're in. Psalm 12 ends with a negative statement, which is odd for a psalm to end negatively. Verse 8, the wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. It ends in a negative statement, yes, but the tone has shifted. And we'll see this countless times, specifically in the Psalms that King David writes. He begins with this lament, this woeful cry, the godly are gone. I look around, everybody's lying, everyone's deceptive, I don't know what to do. Now he ends by simply stating facts about a sinful world. Yet another reminder, God doesn't promise to remove you completely from every single difficult situation in your life. But he does promise not to change the circumstances. He promises to change you. And as you endure the same circumstance, it's completely different now, not because anything external is different, because you're different. David looks at the world around him, doesn't like what he sees. So he goes before the Lord and he asks for help 
confidently knowing that God will answer, so confident that he assigns God's words to him, and now instead of fearing, instead of withdrawing from a wicked world, he turns and faces that same wicked world with confidence. Friends, we can do the exact same thing. No different at all. There is, there is much in our world when we take a look at it that we don't like. There is much in the mirror when we look at it that we don't like. There is much in our lives and in our world that we cannot control. We don't know what to do. It feels at times like our lives are falling apart. It feels like the world is falling apart. Friends, it's always felt that way. Every generation since the beginning of the world has felt exactly like you feel. And we feel alone because it seems like we've been abandoned. Those who were once faithful aren't faithful. They all lie. They're all in it for themselves. What do we do? We pray for help. We're powerless. But we know a God who is all-powerful. We know so little about the world and what's happening in it, yet we know a God who is all-knowing. I can't even control my facial expressions when people say dumb things to me. <laughs> but my God controls the universe. And that God promises to help. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Because I want you to see that this isn't some disconnected Old Testament reality. That now for the Christian, this is more true than ever. It was true then, it's more true now. It was real for King David. The help that God offers to you is better than David ever experienced in his entire life. Because you have an access to God that even David didn't have. Hebrews chapter four, after speaking about the offer of salvation of the believer's rest, they can come into God's very presence. The, after speaking of the power of God's word, that it's, it's living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it can penetrate, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, all things are laid bare before God at the speaking of his word. Here's the conclusion. Therefore, verse 14, therefore, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us take hold of our confession. Let's grab on to what it is that we say we believe, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, verse 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For all those who, who have trusted in Christ, that is the offer of the all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe. That's what he extends to you right now at every single moment. You don't have to go through some you know, formulaic, I have to say these things and do these things you know, like they did in the Old Testament. We have to offer these kinds of sacrifices and say these kinds of prayers and then I can go into God's presence and he won't kill me. Right now without a second's hesitation. You don't even have to go in trembling or fearful. You run. You can go to God's very presence with confidence to a throne of grace. Ironically, not described as a throne of power because that's what thrones represent. It's a throne of grace. And there in his presence by the work of Jesus alone, because of him, we will find all the mercy, all the grace that we need to help us in our time of need. You can confidently ask for help because it's already been promised to you 
from the God who doesn't lie. Oh, friends, that's good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words of encouragement. Because when we look at our world, when we look at our own lives, we don't like what we see. And we would use even some of the same words and the same phrases that David used so long ago. But thank you that the words of a king from 3,000 years ago are still relevant, are still helpful, are still true. Because you haven't changed. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now because of him, we come running. We're welcomed. We're invited. We're compelled to come into the presence of the God of the universe and ask for help. Because you promise to offer it. How gracious you are. How kind you are. So thank you that you help us when we cry out for forgiveness, when we cry out for your power to overcome something in our life that dishonors you. Thank you that you promise to help when we want to put one foot in front of the other and continue to be faithful to you, to continue to honor you, no matter the situation we find ourselves in with our marriages, with our families, with our neighbors, with the workplace, with what's going on with finances, with what's going on uh, with politics, all this stuff that we look at and watch and our hearts break over at times, you're there. You have not abandoned your people and every promise that you have made, as Second Corinthians says, every promise is yes in Christ. You've already said yes to all the promises you've laid out to your people. So thank you that when we cry out for help, you give it because that's always been true. Certainly it was true of our salvation that we stopped to remind ourselves of now. So we take communion together, as we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice, we remember your saving work, that for all who turn in faith to Christ and cry out for salvation, you grant it. It's there. So thank you for saving grace, for sovereign help in time of need. Thank you for Jesus. We remember him now. In his name we pray. Amen.